Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much to the PFF for the invitation. It's a pleasure to come here. It's been an exciting meeting so far. Um, so I'm going to talk about the profile study, which uh, was originally funded by GSK, uh, and which we set up back in 2009, I think a few months after Andreas set up the, the European registry. Those are my disclosures. So perhaps the, the genesis of the profile study was slightly different to what we've heard before now. Um, I think one of the excitements about IPF, or perhaps one of the challenges, is that with such a complex pathogenesis, we have a huge number of potential therapeutic targets uh, to, for which we could potentially develop treatments. Uh, this slide just outlines some of the drugs that are currently in trials around the world at the moment. And the question is, how do we take these forward into the clinic as quickly as possible without subjecting patients to huge trials where they develop no benefit? And I'm sure you're all au fait with the, the clinical trial development pathway, going from phase one studies in healthy volunteers through to regional, registrational studies at phase three. And one of the challenges is that this takes time. Uh, so your typical drug from phase one through to approval in the clinic can often take as long as 10 to 12 years if everything goes successfully. And part of the reasons for that is that IPF trials are long and complicated. So this was the ASCEND study. Uh, you'll all remember this was a 52-week study using FVC as the primary endpoint. It took approximately three years from the first patient to be recruited to the last patient completing 52 weeks. It's an enormous undertaking, and these studies cost hundreds of millions of dollars. We also have examples of studies where we've seen failure, and one of the challenges with this sort of study is we don't even know why the trial failed. So this was the study of simtuzumab, a loxal 2 inhibitor. 550 patients were followed for up to 130 weeks, and the study was negative. And we still don't know if it's because the wrong dose was used, the drug didn't get to where it was meant to be, uh, or perhaps Loxal-2 is just not a good target. And so it's very unsatisfactory for all of us, patients, caregivers, trialists, to see this sort of study. And so one thing that we can develop to try and shorten this process is a biomarker. Uh, and we've heard some talk already of biomarkers. But essentially, these are things that we can measure that either tell us about health or disease uh, or response to treatment. And whilst we tend to think of biomarkers as blood tests, they can also be imaging tests or lung function uh, or pretty much anything else we can measure. And in clinical practice, we can use them in different ways. We can use them to identify patients at risk of progression. We can use them to help diagnosis, such as CT scan. We can use them to assess disease severity, such as lung function. We can try and predict who's going to get worse. Uh, or ideally, we can also work out who has responded to therapy. And so when we set up the profile study, we really wanted to be able to identify biomarkers that address those different needs. Uh, and this was a study run in the United Kingdom uh, between our center at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London uh, and in collaboration with Geesley Jenkins in Nottingham uh, and a network of secondary care hospitals there. Uh, and we set out to recruit 600 patients, newly diagnosed, and then to follow them at regular intervals for the next three or more years. And as you can see from this schematic, at each visit, we collected clinical information, lung function data, biological samples, uh, quality of life measures, uh, and at baseline, we also collected bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage. Uh, these are the patients that participated. We held regular open days, and uh, I have to say I'm incredibly grateful to all the patients who did participate and who willingly gave up their time to be part of the study. Uh, as I've told you, we conceived of the study in 2009, uh, and we started recruitment in September 2010. We actually ended up over-recruiting. Uh, we en enrolled 660 subjects, uh, all of whom have now been in the study for well over three years. Uh, I will say that until 2013, we didn't have available antifibrotic treatment. So for the first three years of the study, it really was a natural history study of, of how IPF progresses uh, without therapy. 
Uh, and in keeping with some of the other registries, you can see that the median survival for our patients is just over three years. Uh, again, if we do the plot that Andrea showed for the European registry, we do see some improvement in survival since the advent of antifibrotic drugs. So just to show you some of the things we did with the cohort, um, we tried to develop home monitoring, uh, so using handheld spirometry as a way of measuring disease progression and behavior. We were able to show that home monitoring can be done effectively, that patients can reproduce measures that we obtain from them in clinic. It gave us a clear understanding of how the disease progresses. So this is one patient, and each dot on that chart is a single daily FVC measurement, uh, and he was in the study for 18 months. You can see quite clearly how his disease has progressed over time. This is another patient with rapidly progressive disease, and sadly he died 220 days after enrolling in the study, and you can see the very rapid rate of decline in his lung function. And then this is another patient who's had an acute exacerbation, uh, and you can see there in the middle of the graph that over a two-week period of time, he lost a quarter of his lung function. And just, I'm sure everyone's aware of the challenge of acute exacerbations, but we see this massive insult and injury to the lung often tri triggered by infection. And by the time patients present with this sort of CT scan, it's often very difficult for us to treat the disease. So one of the things we were hoping to try and do was to identify uh, these episodes ahead of time. Uh, we were able to look at how the disease behaves across a group of patients, and you can see some patients are stable over a 12-month period of time, but probably three times as many uh, progress rapidly, uh, and the average patient without treatment loses about 12% of FVC over 12 months. Uh, what we were able to show was that by measuring home values, it gave us more information than just measuring values in the hospital alone. We could work out pretty quickly whether patients had progressive disease or not. We've subsequently used home handheld spirometry as a clinical trial endpoint. Um, we had some teething problems in this trial. We presented the poster uh, in the poster session yesterday and presented the data at the ERS. Um, but you can perhaps appreciate from this chart that one patient in the placebo group gained 33 liters of FVC. I mean, clearly, this is spurious. The man did not expand like this. Um, it, it was a problem that we had with the home spirometers. But we've been able to take learnings from the profile study into this trial, and we're going to learn further um, from the challenges we did have. And it's fair to say that the hospital spirometry showed a treatment effect. We've also then um, done what others have done and look at protein biomarkers. Uh, and I think as Dan has alluded to, when we look in the blood of IPF patients, we see huge differences compared to healthy controls. Um, IPF is sort of a rich disease for trying to discover protein biomarkers, but it's then the challenge of how we um, convert those into practice. Um, we've done quite a lot of work with a small company called Nordic Bioscience where we've looked at markers uh, of collagen degradation and been able to show a relationship between those and disease progression. We've also, working again with Nordic, uh, looked at markers of collagen synthesis and again show that you can map disease progression by measuring uh, these markers of collagen turnover in the blood. We've also looked at epithelial damage markers, again, we can find markers that map with disease progression. Uh, and again, we've then tried to take this on uh, and apply it practically. So this was a study sponsored by Boehring at Ingelheim, uh, where we looked at um, three months of treatment with nintedanib compared to placebo. Uh, and we're hoping from that, that data set to try and identify treatment markers, so biomarkers that will change following therapy with antifibrotic drugs. Um, our first choice marker was negative. This was one of the collagen degradation biomarkers, um, but we're doing uh, analysis of a lot of the other biomarkers that I've already shown you, uh, and I'm optimistic that we will be able to pull out some of those that show us about response to treatment. We've also then used some of these learnings to develop early phase studies. So this was a small study that we did with GSK with a, a pan-PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitor, uh, where we gave patients drug for seven days, repeated baseline PET and bronchoscopy at the end of, beginning and end of study, 
uh, and we also measured a series of phosphorylated proteins uh, in the Lavage inflammatory cells. And with this study, we were able to show that the drug, uh, when given orally, effectively downregulated um, downstream pathways of PI3 kinase, but also looking at the collagen synthesis markers, so the Pro-C6 and Pro-C3 along the bottom there, we were able to show rapid changes in collagen synthesis following administration of this drug. And interestingly, these same markers work in liver fibrosis. We've also contributed samples, and I think this is an important part of all of these registries, and I think as Dan alluded to, trying to join up a lot of the work that's being done. But we've been able to contribute samples to David Schwartz's group for their uh, genetics analyses. Uh, we contributed samples to Naftali Kaminsky and his um, peripheral blood transcriptome. Um, we've also, as I've told you, looked in lavage fluid uh, and started to identify changes in the microbiome in the lungs of patients. Uh, and importantly, again, these seem to be biomarkers of outcome predicting survival in patients. Uh, and interestingly, they relate back to the genetics. We've also started looking at the cellular profile of, of cells in the lung, and we can use um, cell surface markers and flow cytometry, again, to identify differences between healthy individuals and IPF patients. Uh, and again, we see some relationships with survival. Uh, again, the, the joy of having all of this data on our individual patients is that we can start to look across modalities. So this is looking at the microbiome in relation to CT abnormalities. Uh, and as time goes by, we hope to integrate these complex data sets to look for relationships we might not otherwise have seen. We're also working on the imaging, uh, and again, trying to develop imaging biomarkers that we can use effectively in future trials. Uh, whilst it's obvious in a case like this one, when there's disease progression, if we're to use this as a trial endpoint, we want to pick up much more subtle change. And so again, having the scans that we have within the profile study uh, is allowing us to work with groups who have the tools uh, to analyze CT images. Uh, and Simon Walsh's name has already been mentioned, uh, but he's now working with my group to develop um, artificial intelligent approaches to reading CT scans and hopefully developing novel uh, trial endpoints. And so uh, you've seen a similar slide from Dan, uh, but ultimately what we want to do is identify a sort of fingerprint of disease. We want to use uh, all of these modern omic-based tools, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics, and we want to take the detailed information we've got about the clinical phenotype of our patients and integrate those so that hopefully we can understand the disease in a better way uh, than we do already. And I think move from having sort of uh, arbitrary signaling pathways that we choose for research, but instead understanding how all the different pathways uh, interact with one another. And again, that's where the artificial intelligence is beginning to help us. And I think there's going to be a huge need for bioinformaticians because this is super complex um, stuff. And once you start to try and do it longitudinally, the maths becomes incredibly complex. And I think we should be looking for the next generation of data scientists to try and engage them in fibrosis research before they go off and work with the oncologists, or even worse, go and work in investment banking, because that's where all the money is. Um, so obviously, I didn't do all this work alone. I have my team uh, and all the other people that collaborated in recruiting patients. I've already shown you the pictures of the patients themselves who were incredibly engaged with the work we've done and who remain incredibly engaged. Uh, and of course the funding bodies who provided the money uh, to pay everyone's salaries, so thank you. <laughs>